introduce our speaker, Karen, who's been waiting patiently to bring us her wonderful presentation. Hello, girls. Some of you know Karen because she's been a member of this club and she was a past president. Uh, she retired from 25 years of teaching in the Montgomery County Public Schools, teaching social studies, mostly world history, world geography. She also taught the only classes in African American history ever taught in Montgomery County Schools. She was a coach of the competitive public speech, speaking team and at Blacksburg High. And since she's retired, she's been working on research in local history and her family genealogy. She's the mother of two sons. One lives in Nashville and one lives in Japan. So please welcome Karen Fetch. The INS technology person suggested we close those back doors because there's a lot of sunlight coming in that way and you might be able to see a little bit better if the doors are closed. I don't know about you, but when I heard the title, The Hello Girls, I had a lot of questions in my mind. Uh, it sounds a little bit risque, maybe. Uh, but that these women were anything but that, and uh, they are very, very impressive women. I just, I couldn't resist her. Okay, this is based on the book that was just given as a prize. There's also a video uh, called The Hello Girls, and uh, if you did the, if you saw this on LOI, you saw the most of that movie. Uh, it's too long to show here today, so I've done something entire. I hope it's entirely different, um, so or mostly different anyway, so that the people who saw the LOI presentation will see something different. But also, um, uh, I did take some stills from the movie, but I added other shots to kind of broaden this. Both the book and the movie came out uh, in, in coordination with this. This is a building that had existed in Arlington National Cemetery for quite some time. But there was no memorial for women in the military. And so uh, this was renovated and a new display was installed to salute the women uh, on the anniversary of women's suffrage and also on the anniversary of the first women in the military. In the United States. Now, just to set the scene slightly, the biggest domestic policy in 1914, 1918, was women's suffrage. They'd been trying to get the vote for many, many years, and they were getting very, very little help from any of the men who were in power. President Wilson, I mean, this is a display out of the uh, demonstration out in front of the White House. They were there every day for over a year through rain and snow and sleet. And Wilson was very much opposed to the idea of women's suffrage. Uh, he thought that it would undermine what was good for a proper woman. He didn't define what proper woman was. Uh, others thought that, well, women couldn't vote because the import, most important responsibility of a citizen was to defend the country. And women obviously didn't have the physical capabilities of defending the country, so therefore they they just, by definition, couldn't vote. And so it was a, a very contentious time domestically, but also on the horizon, war was looming. And it, it, many of you probably know about the Zimmerman Telegraph that Germany sent to Mexico, allegedly. We don't know for sure that it happened. But uh, Germany was trying to draw Mexico into the war so uh, there would be an enemy right on our southern border. Then the Lusitania was uh, sunk. 
So Wilson had to go from his position of being adamantly opposed to the war to having declared war. One of the problem was, the problems were we didn't have an army. We had very few regular army officers. And so they had to pass a Selective Service Act. They had to get volunteers. These are a couple of posters. Well, this is a poster that you've probably seen, the one on the left. The one on the right is a piece of sheet music, the cover of a piece of sheet music. Uh, the, the lyrics were very modern, and I did not bother to copy them down. But the idea was they wanted to get men to volunteer. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the friendship between the United States and France. This was a very common poster, and if you can't read it, they wave for liberty, the flags of France and the United States. United in the grandest cause the world has ever known, these flags shall wave till wrong is overthrown. And there was a lot of sentiment, sentimental patriotism. Uh, we don't have, we didn't have a standing army, but we did have some military heroes, and one of those military heroes was Black Jack Pershing, who had distinguished himself in the Spanish-American War, both in Cuba and in the Philippines. And he said publicly, if asked, he would serve as commander of the army. And so he was asked, and he became the commander of the American Expeditionary Force that was to be going to Europe. This was all in early, late 1917, early 1918. Pershing was uh, committed to serving, or excuse me, to fighting a modern war. I mean, you have to realize that people in Europe were still fighting on horseback with sabers in some cases. Ambulances were still horse drawn. Um, weapons were Civil War era in some cases. Pershing wanted to fight a modern war, and that meant modern, trans modern weapons, of course, but it also meant modern transportation, and it meant modern communication. And that meant telephones. Now, I'm going to use, this is a difficult uh, thing to see, but I really wanted to try to show it to you. This is men stringing telephone wire on the battlefield. Excuse me. These lines kind of indicate where the wires are, and there are dozens of lines between those red lines. And they're being connected to a field switchboard that is hidden underground right here. And this is the kind of communication that Persian wanted installed. And the French had some telephones. And the men would operate the telephones in the field. This is before the advantages of radio, which was common in World War II. Of course, they would be astonished at our cell phone capabilities. Communication was a serious problem at this period of time. So, Pershing decided he wanted telephone operators. They were to be bilingual and he wanted women. Because the telephone companies had decided way back in the 1880s that women were much better telephone operators than men were. And Pershing and his staff didn't bother to wait for any enabling legislation they just started recruiting women to be telephone operators. And it was a good job for a woman. I remember most women in this day and age didn't work. Grace Banker had a college degree from Barnard College. She was bilingual. And the very best paying job she could get was as a telephone operator. And she was one of the very first that applied to be part of Pershing's contingent of telephone operators. And the ads were put in the newspapers. Uh, a call for young women to, uh, to be telephone and telegraph operators. And, and they tried to, again, to rely on emotion. They circulated these um, posters in places where women were. But there were, they were strong uh, requirements. You had to be bilingual, and you had to be experienced. And the women believed that they were going to be in the Army. Their employer, the Bell Telephone Company, believed they were going to be in the Army. And the recruits were told, this will be the only unit composed of women in the entire Army. You will wear a uniform, you will wear insignia, and this is going to be a lot like the British Women's Auxiliary Corps. 
So the first 25 women sailed for Europe in March of 1918 aboard this troop ship, and they were the only women on board. The rest of the ship was full of men. They arrived in France and went to Paris, and they were under the command of Grace Banker, and the Bar College graduate. She was in her late 20s. She had one girl who was only 16 and lied about her age, and they hadn't found out about that yet. She had one woman that Grace thought was quite old. She was 35. <laughs> uh, Pershing stayed, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, let's go back. Forgot something. Even as the women were sailing, the army was arguing about whether or not they were in the army. Uh, the army didn't really want that. Pershing staff had kind of ignored the possibility that they weren't in the army. And uh, there were a lot of a lot of people in the army who uh, were objecting, you know, the, the men in the army were objecting to the idea that women could be in the army. Uh, one of the comments was, army lawyers ruled the females innately possess physical disqualification for the work of military officers. And they even extended that to female physicians. It was all right for female physicians to take care of people at home. They didn't want female physicians in the theater of war. But the women were already on the boat. They didn't know about all of this controversy. Pershing's staff knew about the controversy. But they felt, you know, they were getting ready to fight a war. They were training men. They were shipping millions of men to the continent with all the supplies they were going to need. And as one guy said, it's a cool thing. I do not choose to argue at this time. So here the women are in France. And according to the army, they're not in the military. But they didn't even know that. This is the day they arrived in Paris. They're outside of their hotel that very night. They had to take refuge in the cellar of the hotel because of shelling from artillery from the enemy. Now, I don't, this is a shot from that movie, and I don't know whether this was near their hotel or if this is just a generic photo of the damage caused by the shelling. That wasn't clear uh, from the movie. But a lot, of, a lot of damage. But the women went right to work. Their switchboards were set up and they began to work. When the women were, uh, when, the, when the men were running the telephones, it would take 60 seconds, maybe even longer, for a connection to be made. Now, if you're in the battlefield and you're trying to talk to your commanding officer or you're trying to talk to another unit, 60 seconds is an eternity, especially if you're under fire and you they're shooting in the wrong direction or something. The women could make a phone call in about 10 seconds. And an average woman could make 50 or more calls in an hour, whereas an average man couldn't come anywhere close to that. It's part of the reason why the phone company had gone to all women operators 35 years before. The women worked under terribly hard conditions. This is a picture taken um, a German prisoner of war knocked over a stove that was being used to heat the quarters. Now, whether he knocked it over on purpose or accidentally, I don't know. It, was, it wasn't said. Uh, some of the off-duty operators and men in, uh, from the American Army tried to put the fire out and were dragging the women's belongings out trying to save as much as they could. The switchboard was in a building next door. The women who were on duty kept putting the calls through. They were devoted to their duty, and they could work under extreme pressure. This is a map. The black line show you where the American forces were located. And I know you can't read it very well, but um, the little, it looks like a finger sticking out. That's the news line. And the arrow is pointing to an area called Sunny Hill, which was where a lot of the army action involving the American forces was. The star down in the bottom right hand corner is where the switchboard was. 
They were only 20 miles or so from the action. And remember that the Germans had a gun that could shoot a cannonball more than 20 miles. This is Grace Banker's hand-drawn map of where all of the ex telephone exchanges were so that they could keep track of uh, where the call was coming from and where they were putting the call through to. That star is on the same spot as the star in the previous map. So they really weren't very close to the action. When the armistice came on November 11th of 1918, everybody was very excited. And, but at home, they were still arguing over women's suffrage. And in the fall of, uh, of 1919, Congress finally passed the 15th Amendment, or excuse me, the 19th Amendment, and they had to uh, then get, get passed in the states. The reason this is important is because it indicates the attitude of men toward women at this time. They were patronizing, they were paternalistic, they looked at women as pretty, useful in some ways, but not useful in other ways. And certainly, they were not regarded as first-class citizens. But eventually, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify this amendment in August of 20, 1920. It took a whole year. And so then the Equal Rights Amendment became law. By the way, Virginia didn't officially ratify that amendment or another almost 50 years. But the men in, in the Army needed to go home. Well, that takes a lot of communication. That takes a lot of organization. So when the women thought they were going to go home, uh-uh, they needed you. Your bilingual capabilities are absolutely important. The women were not going to go home. The men were beginning to go home. A team of women operators was actually sent to Koblenz, uh, Germany, to help run the uh, Army of Occupation. So by Christmas of 2018, some of the soldiers were already getting home, but none of the women had been given permission or orders to leave. Now, one of the nice things that they were given was that they were they, there was a big ceremony at at Pershing's headquarters. And the women were given these beautiful little books, a nice touch that the books were bound with lavender cord. I don't know, I think that's nice. Purple's my favorite color, but at the same time, it seems kind of diminishing to me. Uh, but they had thank you letters in there from more than 20 generals. They had autographed pictures of Pershing and some of his staff members and so on. Uh, 30 of the women were singled out for special praise, and Grace Banker, who had been their commander, was given the Distinguished Service Medal. She was the only woman in the entire military, U.S. military that was awarded that high an honor. Only 18 people in the single in the single war were honored. This is a person said quarters, by the way. Now, why did I take this picture? Uh, Several thousand men in two units were ordered by the American military to go to Siberia to, quote, stabilize Russia. They weren't sent home, they were sent to Siberia for a couple of years. Now we're going to forget about them for a while, and we'll forget about them completely. By the end of the war, the United States Army Signal Corps and the Hello Girls had connected over 26 million calls in at least two languages. Two of the women had died. Uh, Cora Bartlett had actually died from tuberculosis that she contracted in Europe. It settled in her spine, and she died a very painful death quite rapidly. These two women were the only ones that were given a, a funeral with full military honors. When the women got home, as it is said by this woman who was a brigadier general retired from the Air Force, Home they came, and did they get their veterans' benefits? No, they did not. Because they found out the Army didn't think they were in the Army. Every place they turned, Veterans Hospital, American Legion membership, soldiers' bonuses, no, you weren't in the Army. 
no, no, no. They were told they weren't really in the military. They had been civilian employees. They, you know, they were contract employees, and they all said, "We never signed a contract. We don't have a contract." But they were civilian employees. They already said they hadn't taken the oath of office. Some of them had actually kept the papers signed where they had sworn the army oath. But the military didn't even bother to look at them when they were submitted. You are in the military. No. There would be no military discharge. They would not be honored in any way. They were not eligible for any service medals or anything like that. No matter how many times some officer had said to them, get over it, you're in the army now. They went in the army. Where are you in the army? Grace Mucker got married, she had kids, and she very quickly decided she didn't want to put up with what she called uh, the civilian politics, civilian prattle. Merle Egan, who had been sort of the second command, she felt very much the same way. Her husband encouraged her to apply for the service medal, but she, she was discouraged and she didn't want to. Then, she happened to be visiting a hospital as a volunteer, and she discovered that there was a group of yeomanettes, women who had been in the Navy, and they were getting all of the benefits that were being denied to the Hello Girls. And that made her really angry, and she embarked on a career that lasted most of the rest of her life, 60 years plus to get recognition for the Hello Girls. It all came down to one word difference in the enabling. First of all, the one difference was Pershing had waited for enabling legislation. Second was the Navy's documents contained the word person or persons. The Army's documents contained the word man or men. And it was those two things that were the key difference. Merle worked really hard. She wrote hun literally hundreds of letters. She got very favorable replies from people whose names you might recognize. Hubert Humphrey, Everett Dirksen, LBJ, Ted Kennedy, JFK. She got really nice replies from them. But that's as far as it went. She started giving, going to schools and giving talks. She made it. She dressed a doll in a copy of her uniform. She was furious because the Navy had enlisted all of these people, and Pershing hadn't. So hadn't followed the rules according to the Army, and so they weren't getting any help. In 1924, Congress awarded bonuses to veterans, but not the women of the Civil War. The Secretary of War does not consider they had the same status as Army nurses. 1926, the War Department considered women not only unnecessary but troublesome, even though they had employed over 100,000 women, and most of them were here in the States. They were secretaries and clerks, but still, they had employed over 100,000 women, but women were unnecessary. And the Navy had employed about 13,000. In 1934, FDR personally asked Congress to pass legislation to reward them. In 1936, this guy, who was the adjutant general of the Army, uh, refused it to give them any kind of recognition. He said they were not required to take the oath, and he refused to even open the documentation that they had sent. So they were out of luck one more time. In 1950, Robert Taft, who was a senator and he became a, a presidential nominee, introduced a bill for recognition, but the bill never made it out of the Senate. <coughs> but then the Korean War came along and the whole country was focused on the Korean War. Now, before 1950, Congress had passed a law uh, in 1942 allowing women to be in the military for World War II. 
And that's where we had the wax and the waves. Maybe of you, some of you have heard of them. Women in the Army, women in the Air Force, women in the Navy and Coast Guard. But they had come into the Army in a traditional way, not the way Pershing had brought in the Hello Girls. Uh, and the Korean War occupied people's attention, so again, there was no recognition. Between 1927 and 1977, people in Congress introduced at least 24 different bills to acknowledge these women veterans. And the War Department blocked each and every attempt. Oh, I forgot to say, beginning in 1921, the American Legion started expelling any women who had been allowed to join local units. The national organization decided that women couldn't join the American Legion. But the girl kept working. Uh, there was an organization founded for all women veterans, including people from World War II. And they had conferences and banquets. I love this. You see the three women standing in white over here on the side. A black thing they have around their neck is their telephone operator's mouthpiece. I, I love that picture. And still, no recognition. Now, remember those guys that got sent to Russia? They were there for a couple of years. They came home. They wanted their veteran benefits. And they wanted back pay for all they had been in Russia. The army said, Oh, you were civilian employees while you were in Russia. And they said, No, we weren't. Yeah, you had kind of, no, we didn't have contracts. We, we were wearing uniforms. We were marching in, in units. We had military orders, military commanders. And the army kept saying, No, you were civilian contracts. Finally, in the late 1960s, they filed a lawsuit against the federal government, and the federal courts said in 1971 they were in the military because they had been treated as though they were in the military. They were in uniform, they were being commanded by military officers, and whether the Army wanted to recognize it or not, they were in the military. And so they were going to get back pay in several weeks later. That's important. In 1977, Barry Goldwater, who had been a general in the Air Force, and who was not really fond of liberated women, but he felt that the women pilots, the WASPs, who had been used to ferry boats around the country, like from where they were needed to where they were needed, he thought they deserved recognition. And by this time, the National Organization for Women had been organized, and they contacted Merle Egan, and they said, I don't need last name, but this time it's Anderson. They said, you want to get in touch with Mary Coldwater. See if he'll include you in this bill. Merle Egan wasn't real fond of the National Organization of Women, and she was quite honest. She told them that. She said she didn't think, for example, that women should be going to West Point and some things like that. By this time, she was in her 80s. And they said, that's OK. Talk to Barry. We'll, we'll talk to Senator Goldwater for you with your permission. And he agreed that they should be included in this bill. A couple of years before that, Merle had met this young lawyer named Mark Huff from Seattle. He was fascinated by the case. He had done a lot of study on it. And he came to the conclusion that they're part of the reason that they weren't getting the benefits that they deserved was because they were taking the wrong approach. And he said that you know, they had a lot of help, but the help had been ill-advised. And they were relying on the goodwill of people, not on legal reasons. And so he decided to take a different tack. For four years, he volunteered his time. He collected all the semen from Delia that the Army had refused to look at earlier, including the court martial papers for the 16-year-old who had volunteered. He had a well-preserved uniform. He collected lots of letters and photographs and things like that. And he testified on Goldwater's bill in 1977. 
From a legal standpoint, the Army, by treating the women as if they were members of the Army, actually made them members of the military. They wore regulation Army officers' uniforms and insignia. Remember, just six years earlier, the federal court said, if you treat them like they're in the military, they are de facto in the military. He never threatened a lawsuit, but it had to be on everybody's mind that it was possible he would fund the lawsuit for the, in, in, on behalf of these women, and they would win based on that court decision. And no politician wants to look like if they're beating up little old ladies. And by this time, they were little old, the ones who were still alive were little old ladies. Out of the 300 women who finally went to Europe as a hello girl, only 18 of them were still alive. In 1977, Jimmy Carter signed the bill into law. Uh, there are dozens of headline clippings like this one on the upper right. And this paragraph at the bottom is from a letter that Merle Hagan wrote. And I'm not going to take the time to read it all, but one of the things she said. Carter signed a bill and he sent it to the War Department or the Department of Defense, it was known as then, to put the, you know, the enforcement regulations into effect. That's all. They dragged their feet, didn't get that done for two years. But eventually the Army had to recognize that the women had been in the military and what wanted for them was that uniform that, that all that Shaw had so carefully preserved and the court case involving the men that were sent to Russia. Now this woman, Elena Jure, was one of the people who fought long and hard, not as much as Merle did, but she did fight long and hard. And the main reason she wanted to be considered a veteran and she wanted her honorable discharge was she wanted a flag on her. And she got her honorable discharge. It was dated June 1919, or maybe it was August of 1919. I can't remember. It was dated 1919 anyway. And the lower picture is a picture of her granddaughter putting a flag on her grandmother's grave. Now, in case you think things have changed too much, this is Denise Romero. In 1918, she was elected, excuse me, in 2018. She was elected the first woman commander, uh, national commander of the American Legion. She had been in the Army in the, in the 1970s. When she and her husband went to join the American Legion, she was told she should join the Women's Auxiliary. And she said, but I'm a veteran. So they said, well, you, you should really join the Auxiliary. She joined both. And she worked her way up. She was the national for 34 years, and she became the national commander of the American Legion. Just last year, she was made the chairman of the Selective Service Board in Wisconsin. These women, this is a, was at the dedication of the Women's Memorial that I showed you in the beginning. These are all retired military people. I could not find their military ranks for some. The lady on the right tile on the right is a retired brigadier general. And I think they very consciously gave to this picture, which was of these women in France on duty. Uh, there was a, uh, on the anniversary of women's suffrage and the anniversary of the armistice a couple of years ago, there was an off Broadway musical. Didn't go very far, didn't run very long, but there was an up, and you could find it online and listen to some of the music. And last year, a children's book came out, which you could buy on Amazon and hardback for $14.95. You could also buy the video on uh, Amazon. And of course, we all know that the poppy, the field of poppy, symbolizes the field of blood left by the soldiers in World War I. So I thought that was a thing. I think. Anybody have any questions? 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 Either they're all asleep, they're 
your tire, or I covered it. Thank you, Karen. Uh, wow. I, uh, I loved it. I loved it. I, I loved the part about the troublesome women. That was, <laughs> that was my favorite word in the whole presentation. I, is it nice to be troublesome? Let's, let's keep at it, girls. Thank you, Karen. That was very interesting. I, I, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, it certainly caught my interest. So, we are, we are pretty much done today. We've enjoyed a wonderful presentation, and I think the panel was actually really good. So, uh, at least I enjoyed it. Uh, it's better than my usual peanut butter jelly sandwich for lunch. And, um, uh, and it was good to see each of you. We like to ask and remind you that the board members, if you can, and the new members, if you can, uh, remain together here in the front for a little while. And we just want to do a quick meet and greet. Uh, and for the recognition of our new members joining us. Uh, thank you so much. Has anybody had anything else that needs to be brought to our attention? Leave your name tags on the table. There you go. Leave your name tags out wherever Lois is. Leave them out there on the table, I guess. Basket on the table. Basket on the table. And if anybody wants to step up, let me know. Oh, yeah. Sue's begging you to say yes to the nominating committee. Uh, we, we are having a great year, and we want to have a good year next year when Sue serves as president, and yes, Sue will be serving as president, so anyway, thanks a lot, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, it's been a good time, glad it worked out, all right.